As Tony Tucker's reputation as a hard man grew, so did his wealth, and the former soldier just couldn't resist showing it off. Local workers who laid carpets at his £250,000 fobbing home recalled seeing rolls of notes lining the mantelpiece. The sum must have run into thousands. But Tucker didn't have to worry about leaving money lying around. He knew no one would dare steal it. One Sunday morning at his former house in Chafford Hundred, neighbours were disturbed by the boom 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 of loud music. Inside, a professional DJ had been hired to spin records as Tucker lounged in bed with common law wife Anna Whitehead. He had started to live like a mafia don. Parked outside the diamond load property was his new jet black top of the range Porsche with the number plate TT9. A year later, in autumn 1995, Tucker had enough money to buy the fobbing house, but he would only live in it for two months. It was called Brymount Lodge, and came complete with a sophisticated video intercom to vet callers and guard dogs which patrolled after dark. Tucker ran a lucrative security agency which allowed him to pocket a share of the profits from drugs sold at clubs where he ran the door. He was responsible for the infamous Raquel's nightclub in Basildon when the ecstasy tablet that killed teenager Leah Betts was bought there. As the money rolled in, he started injecting a cocktail of steroids and cocaine, and his regime of terror began. A former associate revealed Tucker kept horses stabled near Basildon. He discovered the owner of the stables was in debt and made discreet inquiries to find out who was owed money. Armed with this information, Tucker sent a group of heavies into the riding school bar. It was smashed to pieces with iron rods. The next day, Tucker went to the owner and said he had heard there was trouble and knew who was behind it. He told him if he could stable his horses for free, he would ensure that there was no more violence. A Stanford plumber also had good reason to remember Tucker. He and his son fitted a shower at his new fobbing home. Later, they had a call from Tucker saying it needed fixing. The plumber told him it must be a faulty part and he would contact the manufacturers. Tucker's reply was simple. You obviously don't know who I am. You better get round here now. The following newspaper article comes from the 9th of December 1995 with the headline High Life of Flash Tony. Neighbours of victim Tony Tucker were baffled at how he could afford a £250,000 home and a string of flash motors with no visible means of support. They suspected he was a shady character, but had no idea that he had amassed a fortune from his years at the heart of the Essex underworld. His murder stunned residents in the village of Fobbing, where the gangster owned a hacienda-style bungalow with breathtaking views across open farmland. Tucker's palatial red brick home boasts its own stables. In the front garden is a statue of a naked goddess and Greek urns adorn the front wall. Tucker had a separate garage block for the luxury motors which were often spotted in his drive. These included at least one Mercedes. Neighbours said the drug baron had only recently moved into the house. Tucker appeared paranoid about security. He had an elaborate wall built and iron gates installed to block access to the front of the property. A sophisticated video intercom system was also fitted to vet callers, and after dark, guard dogs patrolled the ground. The detective leading the murder hunt said that Tucker had good reason to fear for his safety. Chief Superintendent Ivan Dibley said of the three victims, these men had been involved with a sort of criminality where it is likely that their lives have been threatened before. Post-mortem examinations were being carried out on the bodies yesterday at Broomfield Hospital Chelmsford. Mr. Dibley appealed for more information from the public. He said, quote, I'd particularly like to hear from anyone who saw a vehicle leaving the farm track at White House Farm or anybody who saw someone thumbing a lift on the A130, which runs past the farm at the relevant time. Mr. Dibley confirmed that the three men arrested on Thursday on suspicion of being connected with the shootings had been released without charge. Murdered drug baron Tony Tucker has been blamed for shooting his own friend Pat Tate and then supplying him with a gun and drugs while he was recovering in hospital. The fateful alleged shooting came a year before both men were slaughtered. Tucker, who was slain alongside Tate and Craig Rolfe on a deserted farm track in Rettendon last December, either carried out the 1994 shooting himself or arranged it and then planted the gun on one of Tate's other pals, it is claimed.
A friend of Tate claims Tucker was jealous of Tate's friendship with the other man. The shooting paints a picture of Tucker as a jealous man capable of doing anything to make sure he got his own way. The incident happened in 1994 as Pat Tate was at home preparing to go to Tucker's party in London. He was in his bathroom shaving when the glass was shattered by a bullet which hit him in the arm. Tate's friend, a woman who does not want to be identified for fear of reprisal, says Tucker stoked Tate's fear and paranoia after the shooting by giving him a gun to protect himself while he was in hospital. She also claims that Tucker supplied Tate with drugs while he was in his hospital bed. The gun which fired the bullet was then allegedly planted at the home of a friend of Tate's. The pal was allegedly questioned about the shooting but no one was ever charged. Tate had not long been out of prison when the bathroom shooting occurred. He had been jailed in November 1990 for six years for robbery and drugs charges but was let out in July 1994 on license. When the pistol and drugs were found, Tate's license was revoked and he was sent back to prison to serve the remainder of his sentence. He was finally released on October the 31st last year, weeks before he and the two other men were shot dead, their bodies discovered in a Range Rover. Police believe the Rettenden shooting was part of a drugs turf war. Tate's mother Marie confirmed that Tucker had supplied her son with drugs and the gun which was found under his hospital bed. She said, quote, Pat could see no wrong in Tony, even when Pat was caught with the drugs and the gun. Tony said he would own up and take the blame to keep Pat out of prison, but he never did. It was a crime which pushed everything else off the front pages. Three men, all known criminals, found shot dead in the Essex countryside. It was a cold-blooded professional killing. The victims had many enemies, but which one wanted them executed? And welcome back to a new video on the Essex Boys case. As always, if you are enjoying the content, please do give the video a thumbs up. And if you're interested in the Essex Boys case or simply true crime in general, don't forget to hit the subscribe button below. The following police statement is from David Courtney, dated the 22nd of December 1995. I employ approximately 200 people for my security business called Courtney's. My main employment at this present time is manager to my girlfriend Jenny Bean. Jenny has a flat at 19 Frederick House, Patch Street, London, SE18. I spend a lot of time at Jenny's flat, but I live at the address shown on the rear of this statement. Jenny has been singing professionally for approximately two years. I have been her manager and provided her security throughout this time. Jenny sings at various clubs throughout England. She has recorded five records and her career is beginning to take off. I have been visited by DC's Cole and Shakespeare and asked if I know Pat Tate, Tony Tucker or Craig Rolfe. I knew Tony Tucker on a purely professional basis to do with security. We have worked together on two venues. One was in South End and the other was in the Loughton area. Both these venues were raves. On each occasion, the security responsibilities were shared between Tucker's firm and mine. One would patrol the perimeter of the venue and the other would be responsible for what went on inside. On each occasion, there were never any problems between Tucker and me, nor did I have any problems with any of his staff. I would describe Tucker as very professional as far as his security business was concerned. It was clear, however, that he was not worried about making enemies. I say this because he appeared to have a very upfront attitude about him. He spoke his mind and didn't seem to worry about offending people. I believe that for one of the venues, Tucker phoned me to make the arrangements and I phoned him to make arrangements for the other. At this time, my phone number was 0171 649 4408 and my mobile number was 0850-367-008. I have had both these phone lines disconnected approximately two to three months ago. I estimate these two venues took place approximately two years ago. I have met Tucker two or three times socially. Once was at Tots nightclub in South End approximately two years ago. The other occasions were at parties at people's private houses. I cannot recall the actual addresses of these parties, but they would have all been in the Essex area. 
I estimate the last time I saw Tucker was approximately one year ago. This was at the car auction at Dartford. This was not a pre-arranged meeting. It was simply a chance meeting with Tucker and a couple of his friends. Since this chance meeting, I have not seen Tucker, nor have I spoken to him on the telephone. I have not ever seen or heard of Craig Rolfe. I have heard Pat Tate's name mentioned in general conversation. I cannot recall who mentioned his name or what the conversation was about. Other than hearing his name mentioned, I do not know anything about Pat Tate. I have never met or spoken to him. I have been asked by DC Cole if I can recall where I was on Wednesday the 6th of December 1995. I was at a pub called the Albion, Pet Street, London, between 1800 hours and midnight. At this time, I was with the following people. 1. Ian Tucker. 2. Mark Bates. I do not know their addresses offhand, but I can obtain them if required. Both live close to me. I was with other people as well, but I cannot recall who at the present time. From the Albion pub, we went to several clubs in the West End, including the Gas Club in Leicester Square. I do recall, however, that my girlfriend Jenny Bean was also with us. We returned to my house, 88 London Road, Forest Hill, approximately 8 o'clock the following day. We met up with numerous people throughout the night, but Jenny was with me at all times. I cannot recall what I was wearing that night. I do not know where Rettenden in Essex is. In fact, prior to hearing about the triple murder on the television, I had not even heard of it. I do not know anything about the circumstances of this murder other than what has been on the news. To my knowledge, I have never been to Rettenden in Essex. I have just remembered another occasion that I met with Tucker. Again, this was a chance meeting at a boxing match at Wembley. I cannot recall who was fighting. This was just a short conversation where we exchanged pleasantries. I am aware that during this fight, Tucker headbutted a member of the security staff, although I did not witness this. The following police statement is from Jennifer Pinto, dated the 22nd of December 1995. I am the girlfriend of David Courtney and we live at the address shown over Leaf. I am a singer and my stage name is Jenny Bean. I have today been asked questions by DC Shakespeare, questions in relation to the shooting of three men in a Range Rover in Essex. I have been told that these men were called Tucker, Tate and Rolf. I do not know of these men and I have never heard of them before. I have been asked to account for the whereabouts of David Courtney, my boyfriend, between 1800 hours on Wednesday the 6th of December and 8am on Thursday the 7th of December. I can recall that between 1800 hours and midnight on the 6th of December, I was in the Albion Public House in Pet Street SE18, near to where we live. We were with Ian Tucker and Mark Bates, who are friends of myself and David. David Courtney was with me in the pub. When David and I left the pub, we went to several clubs in the West End, including the Gas Club in Leicester Square. I was with David all night until 8am on the 7th of December, when we returned to David's home in London Road, Forest Hill. We did not go anywhere near the Rettendon area of Essex. I do not know where that area is. I have no information that I can offer as to the circumstances of this shooting. I can recall these events specifically on the 6th of December and the 7th of December because I was singing at a karaoke in the Albion Public House that night and also because I sang at the Gas Club later that evening. The daughter of a victim in the Rettenden murders told today how she believes the men jailed for the killing could be innocent. Samantha Tucker spoke out for the first time after news that Michael Steele and Jack Wombs have made a significant breakthrough in their quest to have their convictions overturned. Pat Tate, Tony Tucker and Craig Rolfe were blasted to death with a shotgun as they sat in their Range Rover in a deserted country lane in Rettendon in December 1995. Father of two, Jack Wombs and Michael Steele, 56, were arrested five months later and charged with the killings. Samantha, 19, who lives in the South End area, said, quote, I never really thought it was these two men who carried out the murders, so it comes as no surprise there could be an appeal. At the end of the day, if they are innocent, they should be set free. I believe the police will never catch the real killers of my father. Every day I think about him, and although it happened six years ago, I still really miss my dad. I was a real daddy's girl and always looked up to him. I didn't agree with some of the things he did, but I never really saw that side of him. All I saw was a loving dad. I was proud to be his daughter. 
I deplore anything to do with gangsters. It is all just bravado and a sick pathetic image. It is upsetting that all of this has resurfaced again. I thought it was all dead and buried. I just wish we could be left to get on with our lives." End quote. The ruthless killer who gunned down three Essex drug dealers at close range has claimed another victim. The father of one of the gangland victims died of a heart attack when relatives broke the news of Tony Tucker's death. Mr Ronald Fuller, 63, of Folkestone, Kent, collapsed on hearing his 38-year-old son was one of the three underworld villains slain in a Rettendon farm lane. Superintendent Ivan Dibley, heading the triple murder inquiry, described Ronald Tucker's death as a family tragedy. He said, quote, It just shows where the tentacles of a murder inquiry can lead. Detectives investigating the triple killing are looking for connections with the shooting at St Andrew's Hospital Billericay in October, when a patient was blasted with a shotgun carried by a man dressed as a clown. Now police fear revenge attacks as other gang leaders try to muscle in on the lucrative drugs action. Superintendent Dibley appealed for criminals to help them nail the killer who shot dead Tony Tucker of High Road Fobbing, Patrick Tate, 37, and 26-year-old Craig Rolfe of Calshot Avenue Chafford 100 on Wednesday. He urged the underworld to call the incident room with any information on the dealers who paid the ultimate price for their evil ways. Donna Jaggers, 26, Rolf's girlfriend of seven years and mother of their six-year-old girl, made a tearful appeal for help to trace the killer. She said, quote, I would just like anyone who was with them that afternoon, who knows anything about what happened to them, to just come forward. But as more is revealed of the sinister world of the tough gangsters, Neighbours were remaining tight-lipped. For former convict Patrick Tate, the successful attempt on his life was not the first. He survived a murder attempt before, at his Gordon Road Basildon home. A gunman opened up at point-blank range and a tattoo-wearing villain's upper arm was blasted. He was later treated in hospital. Neighbours of Tony Tucker also had nothing to say of the shady character, who had acted as minder for LWBC super middleweight boxer Nigel Benn. The murdered three have supplied ecstasy at night spots in South Essex, including possibly Raquel's in Basildon, where the lethal drug which killed teenager Leah Betts was bought. Interestingly, we have a statement here from a man called Guy Garwood. Now, this is the brother of Donna Garwood, the then girlfriend of Tony Tucker. He gives us a bit of an insight into Tony's behaviour during this time period. The following police statement is from Guy Garwood, dated the 13th of December, 1995. My sister is Donna Garwood. She was recently having a relationship with the deceased Tony Tucker. I was first aware that Donna was seeing Tony around November, 1994. I first saw them together at Raquel's discotheque in Basildon around that time. I was aware that he used to spend a lot of money on her and that Donna idolised him. Because of the age gap between them, I was a bit concerned and took it upon myself to speak to my dad about him. My dad, Brian Garwood, runs a panel beating business at 1A Wanstead Park Road, Ilford. Shortly after I spoke to my dad, he told me he had spoken to a man named Dave DeFreitas who had connections with people in the East London area club scene. My dad told me that the feeling was that although Tony was a big man who could be nasty, he wouldn't be a problem with my sister. It went on that they used to spend a lot of time together. Tony didn't come to my mum's house because she wasn't that keen at first, but tried to come to terms with their relationship. I knew that Tony's current friends were Craig Rolfe and Pat Tate. I was never certain of what the three of them got up to, but I knew Tony used to run a lot of the doormen in Basildon and at Southend as well. I remember Donna told me once that Pat Tate had come out of prison. She said, he's only been out five weeks. She said that since Pat had come out, Tony had become worried about something. He had taken a bit of a low profile. He wasn't himself. Donna said he started staying in with her a lot and Tony was a bit jumpy. Donna said she thought Pat had done something which reflected on Tony, but she didn't say what. Around the beginning of December or the end of November, I came home to my mother's house, 33 Fairview Road, Basildon, 
and found Donna sitting in Pat's black 190 Mercedes. Donna had only recently passed her test, but had difficulty driving it as I understood from her. She had driven it from Pat Tate's bungalow in Gordon Road. At that time, Donna was living at Swanstead number 122 or 123. I ended up driving the car back to Pat Tate's address. I cannot remember the index number. I knew Tony had a black Porsche which got smashed up by Pat Tate. The blue Range Rover as I knew it was Pat Tate's. Before they started using the Range Rover, they were using a brown Ford Granada on an A or B plate. I have not heard any rumours about Tony Tucker, Pat Tate or Craig Rolfe. For my part, I thought they were just involved in running the doorman on the clubs. I do not know of anyone who may be involved in their murders. So what we are going to do now is take a step backwards. We are going to take a look at the police statement from a man by the name of Barry Dorman. What's really good and interesting about this police statement is that it gives us some background into Tate's younger years and also some potential hostility brewing between Pat Tate and Tony Tucker. The following police statement is from Barry Dorman, dated the 8th of December 1995. I'm the above named person and I live at the address Overleaf with my daughter. I have lived at this address for the last 16 years. Around 18 or 19 years ago, I was working as a shift engineer at Tunnel Refineries Greenwich. At this time, I was buying and selling cars in my spare time, and as a result of this, I met a man called Patrick Tate. At this time, Pat was living in Haven Gore Pitsy, and he was about 19 to 20 years old. My contact with Pat continued as I started to see him attending car auctions. As a result of this, we continued our contact on a friendly business basis, but our contact was limited to the dealing in second-hand cars. About 11 years ago, I had a serious car accident, and as a result of my injuries, I had to give up my full-time job at Tunnel Refineries. After about a year, as a result of my continued contact with Pat Tate, it was suggested by him that I try the second-hand car trade full-time. It was through Pat that I managed to acquire the rented forecourt located at the junction of the old A13 and One Tree Hill. At this time, the garage was called Eastern Garage, and the forecourt was a separate entity alongside. I took up the forecourt with my cousin Stephen Dillon, who was already a car trader in London. We named the forecourt Cousin Cars, and began trading in 1985. My contact with Pat Tate increased as he was running another car front on Canvey Island called Beach Autos. My contact with Pat was still limited to a friendly business basis. After about five years, my cousin and I had a big fallout, and as a result, we parted company. I continued to trade and was joined at the site by a man called Graham Law, who at that time was also trading from the Five Bells roundabout site on the A13. After a period of time, the two garages amalgamated as Eastern Garage Car Sales, and I ran the Five Bell site, and Graham ran the One Tree Hill site. We have continued like this to date. About this time, I became aware that Pat Tate had become involved with the police in respect of some criminal matter and that he was in custody. I can remember being contacted by his girlfriend, Sarah Saunders, who told me that the police had seized about £20,000 from Pat, which they believed was drug-related money. It was the first time it was mentioned that Pat may be involved in the dealing of drugs, although I had been aware that Pat took or used cocaine himself. I had known Sarah Saunders for many years, as her grandmother lived very near to my own house. She asked me to help Pat by showing that the money was related to car dealing, not drug dealing, and to do this, she asked me to find for her all of the car invoices which related to car trades between Pat and myself. I did this and handed them to Sarah, and as a result, I was required to attend Chelmsford Crown Court at a later date to give evidence at Pat's trial. I was later told by Sarah that Pat had been convicted of robbery and had been sentenced to a long term of imprisonment. Whilst Pat was in prison, he contacted me, and as a result, I went to visit him at a prison in Kent. He asked me to sort out a vehicle for Sarah Saunders, which I agreed to do. I also visited Pat one other time when he had phoned and asked me to go and see him. My next contact with Pat was when I was invited to Pat's release party at Sarah Saunders' mother's address. At this party, I was introduced to a person by the name of Stephen Ellis by Pat, 
as well as a number of friends and family. I can also remember spending time with a man I know as Bill Baxter. I knew Bill Baxter through the car trade, and I knew that Bill had some involvement with Pat in respect of a car front in South End. Bill Baxter now runs the car front opposite Nova Car Sales on the London Road, Leon C, and I believe Pat Tate still has a financial involvement with Bill Baxter. After the party, I can remember Stephen Ellis and Pat coming down to my car site with a view to Stephen buying a vehicle. At this time, I can remember Stephen Ellis having about £7,000 in cash to spend. To my recollection, this would have been about 18 months ago. Ellis did not buy a vehicle from me, but I knew that he had originally come to me on Pat's recommendations. My contact with Pat continued as before with reasonably regular contact through the trade and the sale of a number of vehicles to Pat. I would describe my relationship with Pat as friendly, although we did not socialise outside of work. It was around this sort of time that Pat started talking about a man called Tony Tucker, who he said he had met at a nightclub where Tony was working as a doorman. I had never met Tony, but I can remember Pat talking about him. It was around this time that I was told that Pat had been shot and he was in Basildon Hospital. I went to the hospital with Graham Law to see Pat, and when I was there, Pat's brother Russell turned up. Although I had known Russell was a car trader, I've had very little to do with him. We only stayed with Pat for about 10 minutes, as I merely wanted to let him know that I had heard and passed on my good wishes. Although I had this regular contact with Pat and we had built up a trust between us, he never told me any details of what he was involved in, other than to do with cars. As Pat knew, I had previously been in the Metropolitan Police Service for a short period, and I was also wary of Pat with his volatile temperament. I was always careful of what I asked Pat, in case he thought I was trying to get information from him. I was later told that the man I had met at Pat's party, Stephen Ellis, was possibly involved in the shooting, although I do not know whether there is any truth in this. I have never asked Pat about the shooting or his other business, as I know he would be suspicious of my reasons. I later became aware that the police had found a number of items in Pat's possession at hospital, and as a result, he was returned to prison. I believe the items included a handgun, a quantity of cocaine, and some tablets. I did not go and see Pat in prison, but I was asked by Pat through Sarah Saunders to dispose of his current vehicle, which was a black 928S2 Porsche, index AN0928S. I took possession of the vehicle from Sarah, and after having some work done on it, I put it up for sale on my car front for around £8,995. When I had the car, I received a phone call from Pat in prison, telling me to keep the money if I sold the car, and not to give it to Sarah or anyone else. I had the vehicle for a couple of months, and during this time I took two deposits on the car, but the sales fell through. When I took the deposits, I used to put a sold sign on the vehicle, and when I did this, I received a visit from the man called Tony Tucker. At this time, I think I'd met Tucker once or twice when he'd attended the car front with Pat, before he was returned to prison. When he came to my garage, Tucker told me to give him the money whilst Pat was in prison. Although I had heard about Tony and I did not want to cross him, I was more concerned about crossing Pat, and therefore I told Tony I would not give him the money. When I stood my ground, I told him what Pat had said. Tony seemed to accept it and left my garage. I kept the car for a couple of months but could not sell it. I therefore returned it to Sarah Saunders. In this time, I only saw Tony Tucker once more when he came up to my car front on a horse and asked me if I had any luck selling it. At this time, I had become aware of Tony moving into a house in Fobbing High Road with a large plot of land. I had a couple of phone calls from Pat whilst he was in prison, but they appeared to be merely for a chat rather than anything specific. The next time I saw Pat was when he came down to my car front after he had been released from prison. This was at the end of October 95, beginning of November. I believe at this time he was on his own, and we had a general chat about domestic and general matters. At this time, he appeared quite level-headed and normal. My next contact with Pat and Tony Tucker was when they came to my garage after Pat had an accident in Tony's black Porsche 928S4, index 9TT. The vehicle was badly damaged, and Pat was asking me to sort it out as cheaply as possible. The vehicle was brought to the One Tree Hill site, and my daughter spent a lot of time trying to locate cheap second-hand spares for the repair. I also arranged for quotes to carry out the bodywork. 
As a result of the Porsche repairs, I began to have virtual day-to-day -day contact with either Pat, Tony or both. The majority of the time they were together and were accompanied by a younger man called Craig. At that time I had a blue Range Rover 3.5 Vogue SE Index F424 NPE on my forecourt as I had recently taken that in as part exchange. I had purchased this vehicle from Mr. Herson of Kingston Road, Stanford La Hope, and I can produce a copy of the purchase invoice for this transaction as my exhibit BDT-1. This was purchased on the 2nd of November 1995. As Tony Tucker was now without a vehicle, he and Pat showed interest in purchasing the Range Rover, which I had for sale at £10,995. After some negotiation, I agreed to sell it to them for £9,800, but I knew that neither Pat or Tony would be able to get finance on the vehicle. When I pointed this out, Tony stated that his friend would be buying it on his behalf, but he would be using it. I agreed to accept a £2,000 deposit and put the remainder on finance. A friend of Tony's, a man who gave his name as Mr P Cuthbert, then attended my site and provided sufficient details for me to complete the finance agreement. I was handed £2,000 in cash at this time, but I'm unable to say which one of them gave it to me. They then took the keys from me and drove the vehicle away from my forecourt. I completed a sales invoice for the transaction and showed the purchaser as Tony Tucker. I can produce a copy of this invoice as my exhibit BDT-2. I then sent off the completed finance agreement and received my cheque from the company for the balance. I am still in possession of the registration document for the vehicle, which I can produce as exhibit BDT-3. The finance company would have issued a paying in book to Mr P Cuthbert to enable the monthly repayments to be made. This book would have been sent to Cuthbert's home address. The Range Rover was taken by Pat and Tony on the 14th of November 1995. From that day, when Pat, Tony and Craig visited my car front, they would be using the Range Rover. Craig would normally be the driver, with Pat in the front passenger seat and Tony in the back. As stated, I had a number of visits from them inquiring about the progress with the Porsche repairs. I can remember during one of their visits, Tony was really annoyed and stated they were trying to link him to the supply of the ecstasy tablet which killed the girl called Leah Betts. He stated that he knew who had supplied it as he had been told by one of the doormen. He also stated that he had made some checks and knew that the girl regularly took tablets and that she didn't even live with her father. He was really ranting and raving to Pat about it and I heard him say that it was only because her dad was a policeman that such a fuss was being made. During the morning of Wednesday the 6th of December 1995, I was at the car front when Pat, Tony, Craig and Mr P Cuthbert arrived in the Range Rover. I would describe Mr Cuthbert as male, white, 5 foot 10 to 5 foot 11, late 30s, reasonably fit build. I have been told he is a ceiling fixer. The four of them came into the office and I was handed by one of them the paying in book relating to the Range Rover finance and between them they produced £321.40 in cash. I was asked by one of them, I can't remember who, to keep the book and remind them when the payments were due. I agreed to do this as it was in my interest to make sure the finance was paid. I had also been told by Pat and Tony at the time of purchasing the vehicle that they intended to pay it off in one lump fairly quickly. I paid this sum into the Barclays Bank at Pitsy Broadway the following day. I can produce the paying in book as my exhibit BDT-4. Sometime during an earlier meet with Pat, he had asked me whether I had a suitable vehicle for him to give to Sarah Saunders. He told me there had been a lot of problems between them and he wanted to give her a car to get her off of his back. I told him I had a VW Passat on the forecourt, which I had taken in as part exchange on the 25th of the 11th, 95. I showed him the vehicle, which was metallic green in colour, and had the registration number F120GGF. He agreed to take it for a test drive and we later agreed on a price of £1,800 for the vehicle. I can produce a purchase invoice for this VW Passat as my exhibit BDT-5. I left my forecourt around 1700 to 1730 hours on Wednesday the 6th of December, intending to play my friend Keith Moore at Squash. At this time my daughter and an employee Mickey Stenning were at the car front. 
En route to squash, I received a phone call from Mickey Stenning stating that Herc, which is my pet name for Pat Tate, i.e. short for Hercules due to his size, had arrived at the car front to collect the VW Passat. Pat then came onto the phone and told me that he would still take the vehicle even though he didn't need it as he had had a bust up with Sarah Saunders. I told him that he didn't have to take it but he insisted that he would. He told me that he would pay me for the vehicle in the morning as he had quote a lump of money coming. As a result I agreed to Pat taking the vehicle that night which he did. The following morning, Thursday the 7th of December 1995, I returned to my car site around 9am. Between 11 and 12 midday, I was at the site talking to a customer when a female approached me and called me by my name, i.e. Bao. I did not recognise her and as I was talking she appeared to move away. A short while later I returned to my office and the same woman approached me and said words to the effect of, Bao, can they trace that Range Rover back to you? Not knowing her, I said, what Range Rover? And she replied, the one that Tony's been using. At that time, I realised that she was referring to the Range Rover being used by Pat Tate and Tony Tucker. I asked her why, and she just replied, oh, nothing, and then she walked out of the office. I would describe this woman as female, white, five foot three, slim build, tan freckled face, with mousy straight hair. I believe that she is the girlfriend of Tony Tucker. I was obviously concerned about why she had come in and asked that question, so I immediately tried to contact Pat Tate on his mobile telephone. When I called the number 0585 429 316, I got no reply, so I tried his other mobile number 0973 740 923. When this was answered, it was by a female who I did not recognise. I asked to speak to the big man, and she said he was out on a job. I asked if everything was alright and she just said, yeah. I then tried to phone Tony on his mobile number of 0385 317 327 but all I got was Tony's answer phone. I did not leave a message. I then tried to phone Tony's home number of 01268 555332 but that was unobtainable. I have not seen Tony Tucker, Pat Tate, Craig or Mr Cuthbert since. Purely as background information, I am aware that Pat, Tony and Craig were heavily into bodybuilding and in their quest to increase their size were injecting substances. I believe that all three of them used a progress gym for an hour each morning. Right, certainly a few things worthy of note during that police statement there. What I find particularly interesting is the fact that we have Pat Tate who's been recalled to prison and we have this sort of distrust, I believe personally, starting to develop between Pat Tate and Tony Tucker. We have Pat Tate speaking to Barry Dorman over the telephone and making it clear to Barry Dorman that if he were to sell this vehicle, this, this vehicle on behalf of Pat Tate, that he must keep the money himself. Do not give it to Sarah Saunders, do not give it to Tony Tucker, do not give it to Craig Rolfe, do not give it to anybody. Keep it for yourself for when I am out of prison. We then appear to have Tony Tucker, who strolls past the car lot, notices the sold sign on the vehicle which Pat Tate is selling, or which Barry Dorman is selling on Pat Tate's behalf, and he goes in to speak to Barry Dorman and asks for the money for that vehicle. You can just kind of imagine it, can't you? You know, him walking in there and saying, you know, I'm going to take this money, I'm going to look after it for Pat while he's in prison, and it really puts Barry Dorman in an incredibly uncomfortable position there. But Barry Dorman has stood his ground. He said, you know, I've heard from Pat. He has told me to keep hold of the money and I'm afraid that's what I'm going to do. And by all accounts, this happened on more than one occasion. On each occasion that the sold sign was put on that vehicle, Tucker would arrive and ask for that money. And then we have quite a curious conversation which Barry Dorman overhears concerning Tucker, Tate and Rolf. It's in this statement that he states the following. I can remember during one of their visits, Tony was really annoyed and stated that they were trying to link him to the supply of the ecstasy tablet which killed the girl called Leah Betts. He stated that he knew who had supplied it as he had been told by one of the doormen. He also stated that he had made some checks and knew that the girl regularly took tablets and that she didn't even live with her father. He was really ranting and raving to Pat about it and I heard him say that it was only because her dad was a policeman that such a fuss was being made. Now this I find a little bit odd actually, so Tucker's there at the car front, 
talking to Pat Tate. And he's is he trying to convince Tate here that he wasn't actually the supplier of the tablet for some reason? Because... I mean, from what I can gather from the documentaries and books I've read or whatever, it seemed, it seemed to have been common knowledge, at least back then, that Tucker was a supplier of this ecstasy tablet. So why is he trying to convince Tate here that it was someone else? Also, another point worthy of note is the following. The Range Rover was taken by Pat and Tony on the 14th of the 11th, 95. From that day when Pat, Tony and Craig visited my car front, they would be using the Range Rover. Craig would normally be the driver with Pat in the front passenger seat and Tony in the back seat. So this is quite interesting because obviously we know when the bodies of Tucker, Tate and Rolf were discovered, we had Craig was the driver, Tucker was the front seat passenger and Pat was seated in the rear. I mean, could it be that Barry Dorman has simply got this wrong here? Was he supposed to say that Tucker was normally in the front and Tate was in the rear? The reason I say that is because of the statement from that tyre fitter who saw them on December the 6th. He claims to have seen the Range Rover travelling towards him and he claimed that uh, Craig Rolf was the driver, Tucker was the front passenger and there was a large male in the rear of the vehicle who he believed to have been Pat Tate as that is how they had sat when he had seen them in the past. So really make of that what you will. But playing devil's advocate here for just one moment, let's say that Barry Dorman is in fact correct, that the normal seating positions with these three individuals when they used to go out would be Rolf driving, Tucker in the back and Tate up front. What would be the reason for Tate being in the rear of the vehicle on December the 6th? Well, let's just assume for one moment that there is in fact a fourth passenger in that Range Rover. I think naturally you'd believe that that individual would be closer to Pat Tate than the other too. It's kind of a natural thing, isn't it? If a, a friend of yours or you're going to pick up a friend, they're going to sit in the back, then the person who actually knows that individual is going to sit in the back with them, aren't they? So could that lend us to believe that Pat actually knew that fourth passenger better than, say, the other two? I.e., if this was in fact steel and this was a different seating arrangement than they normally used, then I guess that could go to explain it. And now we move to part of the statement from Sarah Saunders, who discusses the relationship between Tucker and Tate in a little bit more detail. It's during her police interview that the following occurs. DC Norton asks her, So during the time then he was at Whitemore Prison, what's happening then in your life and the relationship with Mickey and Jackie particularly and Pat and the business? Saunders replies, um, I don't know the dates of this, but Tony Tucker used to come round, I think once a week and give me money for bills and to look after my son and whatever. I think Pat told me that he had heard that Tony had got a new house, the bungalow he'd bought in Fobbin, and Pat didn't like it very much because he thought that possibly, well I don't know how much money Pat had, but he thought that possibly his money was going towards Tony's house and he asked Mick if he could make up some excuse to get his money off of Tony. I'm not sure what Mick said, but I think it was something along the lines of he had a fine to pay off the mortgage. Mick got the money off of Tony because Pat trusted Mick more than Tony. So when Pat Tate was recalled to prison, Tate originally gave control of his finances over to Tony Tucker. But there seems to have been a little bit of a breakdown in their relationship during this time period. We've already got this discussion of Tate coming out of prison, Tony being paranoid by... Uh, Tate's actions or something that Tate had done which reflected badly upon himself and now we've got this situation where Tate after being taken back to prison has given full control of his finances over to Tony Tucker. It was Tucker's responsibility to pay Sarah Saunders X amount of money per week but somewhere down the line Tate seems to have had second thoughts. It's also mentioned later on in Sarah Saunders statement that Tony didn't like Pat having friends. He was quite a jealous person, someone who was quite controlling, really, and he didn't actually like Pat's close friends. He didn't like Steve Nipper Ellis. That was potentially why that whole falling out happened. And Tony liked to have control of everything, even down to Pat Tate and who he would socialise with. This is also echoed in some ways in the following newspaper article. The following newspaper article is from the 29th of the 2nd, 1996, with the headline, Jealous Drugs Boss Shot His Own Pal. Murdered drug baron Tony Tucker has been blamed for shooting his own friend Pat Tate and then supplying him with a gun and drugs while he was recovering in hospital. 
The fateful alleged shooting came a year before both men were slaughtered. Tucker, who was slain alongside Tate and Craig Rolfe on a deserted farm track in Rettenden last December, either carried out the 1994 shooting himself or arranged it, and then planted the gun on one of Tate's other pals, it is claimed. A friend of Tate claims Tucker was jealous of Tate's friendship with the other man. The shooting paints a picture of Tucker as a jealous man capable of doing anything to make sure he got his own way. The incident happened in December 1994 as Pat Tate was at home preparing to go to Tucker's party in London. He was in his bathroom shaving when the glass was shattered and a bullet hit his arm. Tate's friend, a woman who does not want to be identified for fear of reprisal, says Tucker stoked Tate's fear and paranoia after the shooting by giving him a gun to protect himself while he was in hospital. She also claims that Tucker supplied Tate with drugs while he was in his hospital bed. The gun which fired the bullet was then allegedly planted at the home of a friend of Tate's. The pal was allegedly questioned about the shooting, but no one was ever charged. Tate had not been long out of prison when the bathroom shooting occurred. He had been jailed in November 1990 for six years for robbery and drugs charges, but was let out in July 1994 on licence. When the pistol and drugs were found, Tate's licence was revoked and he was sent back to prison to serve the remainder of his sentence. He was finally released on October 31st last year. Weeks before, he and two other men were shot dead, their bodies discovered in a Range Rover. Police believed a Rettenden shooting was part of a drugs turf war. Tate's mother Marie confirmed that Tucker had supplied her son with drugs and the gun which was found under his hospital bed. She said, quote, Pat could see no wrong in Tony, even when Pat was caught with the drugs and the gun. Tony said he would own up and take the blame to keep Pat out of prison, but he never did. End quote. Now I don't know how accurate that newspaper article is, but obviously this gun and the drugs got there somehow, so it isn't really beyond the realms of possibility to suggest that Tony Tucker was indeed the individual who gave those items to Pat Tate. Now, it may not have been intentional for Tate to get arrested with these items and recalled to prison, but what I do find intriguing about this article is the last few lines where we hear from Pat Tate's mother Marie. It's where she states the following. Tate's mother Marie confirmed that Tucker had supplied her son with drugs and the gun which was found under his hospital bed. She said, quote, Pat could see no wrong in Tony, even when Pat was caught with the drugs and the gun. Tony said he would own up and take the blame to keep Pat out of prison, but he never did. Now, with everything that we've heard so far, it's pretty clear here that there is some underlying mistrust between Tony Tucker and Pat Tate. We've got Tate who's recalled to prison with this gun. Did he blame that on Tucker somehow? Was he thinking that actually Tucker was to blame? Did Tucker actually say that he was going to own up to this gun and take the blame himself to keep Tate out of prison? Well, quite clearly that never happened. And then during his time in prison, he probably hears that Tucker's out spending £250,000 on this new house. You know, two hundred and fifty grand back in 1995 was worth quite a lot of money. I think that house now, from memory, is worth well over a million. So let's just put yourself in Tate's position for one moment. You've been recalled back to prison. You've got Tucker on the outside, living the life. He's got this lovely new detached bungalow, lovely, you know, bit of land. And Tate is there, I guess, alone with his thoughts in prison. And now we move on to the situation surrounding Leah Betts. We've got Tony Tucker being public enemy number one. We've got the media frenzy, the media circus surrounding the death of Leah Betts. And I guess this is best demonstrated with a few paragraphs from the book Blogs 19. Even the most laid back member of the firm was feeling distinctly uncomfortable. Normally, Tony Tucker was so distanced from any actual drugs sold in his clubs that it wouldn't have been a problem. But Raquel's was different. The main dealer there, Mark Murray, had suffered a string of police raids on his employees, losing more than 2,500 pills worth more than £40,000 in just a few weeks. It meant that he hadn't been able to pay Tucker his usual rent and had gone into the red. A compromise was reached. Tucker would supply Murray with his ecstasy direct, with Murray buying the pills at twice the usual rate in order to make up the debt. Murray reluctantly agreed. 
he had long realised that it made good business sense to sell tablets that were as weak as possible. They cost the same, but it meant that punters would buy two or three E's during the course of an evening and his profits would be far higher. Tucker's pills were much stronger, so strong that one would let you rave all night long. It would take forever for Murray to repay his debt, but Tucker was determined to get his money back, so he had no choice. The problem Tucker was facing was that everyone knew that his pills were the apples that Leah had taken and that everyone was now talking about. It was only a matter of time before the police found out too. Tucker was certain that he was going to be betrayed. Everyone around him became a potential grass. Every knock on the door was a potential raid. Tucker, very much the brains behind the organisation, was starting to let it all get to him. The paranoia was highly infectious. By the time Darren Nichols arrived at Steele's house early on Monday evening, the master smuggler's mood had gone from bad to worse. Darren Nichols states, Nick was pacing up and down and showing me the pictures of this girl on the front of the local paper. He was really angry, stamping around, swearing, ranting and raving. He was saying, this is bang out of order. This is going to mess it up for the rest of us. Nick was particularly upset because of Leah's dad being an ex-copper. He was convinced that the bloke would pull in all sorts of favours, and thanks to the wall-to-wall -wall publicity the whole case was getting, make sure the gang behind the pills was caught. And as far as Mick was concerned, if one of them got done, and the police started looking into their associates, then he'd be in the frame too. So interestingly here, we have Michael Steele, who up until this point since being released from prisoners, run a quite nice, quiet little operation. He's bringing this stuff in abroad, he's got this this mode of doing it, it hasn't gone wrong thus far, but now all over the papers is Leah Betts. Steele has heard that it is Tony Tucker who is responsible for supplying the tablet. He realises that if one of these individuals get pulled in, it's not going to be long until they come knocking on his door. Now, I don't know how true this is, but I remember watching a documentary on the Essex Boys quite some time ago, and they said that Mark Murray was a cousin of the Blundells. So with everything we know thus far, we have the Dud Cannabis deal. We have Pat Tate who may or may not have paid back his investors who are most likely the Blundells. We also have this issue with Tony Tucker and Mark Murray who may be a, a distant relation of the Blundells or somehow connected to the Blundells. We have this sort of mistrust between Tate and Tucker in the first place. And we also have the phone call on December the 6th, the very phone call at just after 2pm, supposedly, which was to arrange the meet for later that evening, that phone call went to none other than Tony Tucker himself. Raquel's regular drug dealer owed the Essex boys money, but with police all over the club, he couldn't work and he couldn't pay his debt. When the Essex boys threatened him and his family, he turned to the one man in Essex he knew could help him. I said to him, yeah, it can be sorted out. I said, I'll make a phone call now and get it sorted out for you. I made a phone call and the guy turned up on a motorbike with a crash helmet with a 9mm gun. Blundell provided the terrified dealer with the gun, the chaperone and some simple advice. When they turn up, shoot one of them straight in the cobblers. You ain't gonna kill him, just shoot him straight in the cobblers. Or even both of them. The dealer declined this helpful offer. Instead, Blundell called the Essex boys to a meeting. Only Tate turned up, and Blundell took the chance to warn him that his association with Tucker was dangerous. He didn't seem to uh, care much. And I said to him, you know, we saw him keep blanking and all that. But what happens if someone creeps up behind him and goes bang in the back of the head? If you're with him, you're going to get it as well. He looked at me and I said, well, if it happens, it happens. Three days later, it happened. They were found in this Range Rover. All three men were shot through the head at point-blank range. Detectives believe the killings have all the hallmarks of a gangland murder. The following is a police statement from Wayne Mixture, dated the 18th of the 1st, 1996. I live with my girlfriend, Joanne, at an address in Springfield, Chelmsford, Essex. I am currently seeking employment as a digger driver slash ground worker, although in the past I have worked as a doorman in nightclubs and I have also run my own security company. I am involved in bodybuilding, using various gymnasiums throughout Essex and it is through these gyms that I met a person called Pat Tate. 
During 1993, I was working as a doorman at Hollywood's nightclub in Romford, Essex. At this time, I was employed by a man called Tony Tucker. I believed that Tucker had contacts with the larger London nightclubs, so I decided to work hard and befriend Tucker, who I hoped would recognise my good work and promote me into one of these clubs where I'd have a chance to earn better money. During 1994, Tucker became more friendly with me, and on occasions I would drive his black Porsche 928 car for him. I think it's fair to say that on occasions he liked me to drive for him and act as his minder. I am also aware that Tucker was involved in the drugs world, and it was through Tucker that I met his friend Craig Rolfe. At one time, Craig was more involved with Club UK Wandsworth. Tucker would call on me offering me a day's driving, but to be honest, he was full of promises and I hardly ever got paid. Late in the year of 1994, I moved into Tucker's flat in Shearer's Way, Boreham, number 30. I should also say that as I gained his trust, he asked me if I was capable of shooting anyone. I told him that shooting people wasn't in my nature, I just didn't want the hassle. I was also asked if I would cut people. Again, I told Tucker that I would fight anyone if I had to, or I suppose if he asked me to, but again, I could see no point in marking people for life. Also, if you injure people like this, you always have to look behind your back for reprisals, and I didn't really want to become involved to this degree. I think this disillusioned Tucker, who drifted away from me. We argued over rent money I owed him, which only totaled £150. I couldn't believe he would hassle me for such a small amount, so I moved out of his flat. During this time, I was working as a digger driver, which I continued to do into 1995. I was working for David Williams, an old family friend, who has a company called East Coast Tipping. I remained in contact with Tucker, sometimes I would take a day off from digger driving and spend the day driving Tucker's Porsche around Essex. We would usually visit a gym or go for a meal. I wasn't getting any good door work, so I continued earning a living as a ground worker, seeing much less of Tucker. I've been asked to recall my whereabouts for Wednesday the 6th and Thursday the 7th of December 1995. My mother had recently separated from her husband, and my grandmother, who lives opposite my mum's, had just gone to Australia. So to give my mother some support, we spent the week living in my grandmother's home. We were at this address on the Wednesday evening to be with my mother. On Thursday, she works on a late shift, so I cannot be positive, but I can say that we stayed at home in Dakin Drive all that week between both houses. I remember watching the news at around 10pm, where details of a shooting of persons in a Range Rover had occurred in Rettendon, Essex. Joanne was in bed at the time, and I called her to come and have a look. I told Joanne I bet I knew of the people, guessing that it would be the names I would have known from the nightclub world. The following day, which I think was Friday, the names were released as Tucker and Tate. I didn't hear the third name, but I remember telling Joanne if it was Tucker, the third person would have been Tucker's close friend, a man I know as Colton Leach. Later, I heard the third person shot was Craig Rolfe. I've never been in this Range Rover, nor was I aware that they own this type of vehicle. I've never been with Tucker, Tate or Rolfe to this area of Rettendon since I have known them.